Good afternoon, everyone. And in a, in the first item of business today is portfolio questions. And in order to get as many people in as possible, we'll be grateful for short and succinct questions and indeed short and succinct answers. Uh, question one, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on police call handling. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The HMICS uh, published a report, uh, the final report on call handling on the 10th of November. I have been assured by Police Scotland that a detailed action plan is currently being developed and will be presented to the SPA Audit and Risk Committee for scrutiny later this month. Significant steps have been taken to provide further assurances before any decisions to proceed with the remaining phases of the change programme in Aberdeen, Inverness and Dundee. An independent expert review will be commissioned by the SPA before decisions are made about proceeding with the remaining phases of the change programme. At Police Scotland will establish a reference group of senior independent change and call handling professionals who will provide ongoing oversight and advice as the restructuring is progressed. In addition, later this month, HMICS will begin a programme of unannounced visits to call centres until the programme is completed. Findings will be reported back to Police Scotland, the SPA and to the Scottish Government. Thanks, Bruce Crawford. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. I think I understand correctly, uh, President, um, Cabinet Secretary, that Police Scotland were allocated an additional £1.4 million by the Scottish Government in order to enable them to better handle the challenges that they faced over call handling. Can the Cabinet Secretary please let me know what impact that additional funding was able to secure, what benefit it brought to police call handling operations and procedures? Cabinet Secretary. Um, at the time of my uh, statement in Parliament on the interim report from HMICS into uh, call handling matters, I made uh, £1.4 million uh, immediately available to Police Scotland. And this has helped to support and exhilarate the recruitment of staff uh, to improve resilience within the call handling system. Specifically, uh, in the north, uh, Police Scotland has recruited a further 16 staff between Aberdeen and Inverness on a temporary basis. Uh, recruiting uh, permit staff in Dundee has uh, seen a total of 12 successful candidates, with 10 starting uh, next month, and an additional uh, 38 staff have been recruited at Bilston Glen and Govan Service Centres, with the numbers now standing at 383. Uh, these additional funds, uh, President Offer, Officer, have supported Police Scotland and been able to make sure they also uh, have enhanced IT support at their call handling centres to deal with any IT issues that may arise during the course of activity. Thank you very much. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much, and uh, I welcome part of the Cabinet Secretary's answer. I would be interested to know from him, of the 16 additional staff he mentions, how many of those have been recruited to the control room and the service centre in Aberdeen, uh, for what length of period or contract in, uh, in uh, these cases, uh, and how much of the 1.4 million has been devoted to that end. Well, these are obviously specific matters for Police Scotland who are responsible for the recruitment uh, of staff. 16 of the staff are between uh, Aberdeen and Inverness, and I'll ask Police Scotland to provide them with uh, an exact breakdown as to uh, that provision within uh, the Aberdeen uh, control room. As a member will be aware from having raised this issue with me on a number of occasions in the chamber, uh, this is a, an area where we are uh, seeking to make sure that there continues to be resilience in the way in which the call handling centre in Aberdeen is operating as the change process is moving forward. And as I have also outlined to the member in the past, there are now uh, significant safeguards put in place before any further changes occur uh, to the call handling system, including uh, the uh, moving of the Aberdeen call handling uh, system to uh, Bilston Glen, and that those measures have been put in place to ensure uh, that there is a consistency of approach in the way in which Police Scotland are handling this matter, and that the public continue to receive a high quality of service from Police Scotland. Thank you. Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. Could the Cabinet Secretary clarify how local intelligence reported through the 101 number in centralised call service centres is then commuted to local frontline police, such as the named ward officers allocated to council wards in the Forth Valley Division, a new initiative which represents an excellent example of local policing? 
Um, I'm very familiar with the new approach that's been taken within uh, Forth Valley and one which the, I know the new, uh, uh, the new local commander is very keen to see progress on. Uh, what I would say is that once the intelligence is brought to the attention of uh, 101, uh, it is then assessed in terms of its priority and that is then uh, sent on to the local command area where it's then prioritised within their local uh, system to then determine how officers should then respond to that matter. Uh, but as you'll be aware, it's extremely important that we make sure uh, that the information which is provided at a local level uh, is provided in a timely way uh, in order to allow the police to assess at a local level how they respond to that matter. Uh, and that's part of the work which is ongoing within Police Scotland to ensure that it's happening as effectively as possible. Many thanks. Question two, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how many uniformed officers have been deployed to roles previously filled by civilian staff since Police Scotland came into existence. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the deployment of officers and staff is a matter for uh, Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority who are committed wherever possible to use officers and staff in roles which make the best use of their skills, training and powers. Mr. Fraser. Um, can I thank the Minister for his response? He will, however, appreciate the concern of many people across the country about the, the issue of backfilling. Derek Penman, Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary, has said that the current push to maintain an extra 1,000 police officers is pointless unless these are actually performing operational roles. And the recent investigation from the Sunday Herald claimed that fewer than half of Scotland's 17,000 uniformed officers were actually operational. Will the Scottish Government agree to publish proper police strength statistics, breaking down officers by operational role, so we can have proper public information and parliamentary scrutiny and transparency around this issue? Well, as a, a member may also be aware, in terms of parliamentary scrutiny on this particular issue, it's a matter which has recently been given attention by the Justice Committee in this Parliament. And the uh, Deputy Chief Constable, uh, Neil Richardson, gave evidence to the Justice Committee just on the 1st of December, uh, where he made it very clear uh, that there is no policy of uh, backfilling of civilian posts by uh, by police officers, where there are occasions uh, where it may be uh, a change in the way in which they are providing a particular service, uh, they may move operational police officers into that particular role because they have the skills in which to undertake that responsibility. Additionally, there may be occasions when uh, there will be circumstances when civilian staff uh, may be off uh, on sick leave or on uh, training where they may use uh, operational uh, police officers for the purpose of providing that particular uh, service over that period of time. However, as, uh, the, uh, as I say, as uh, uh, the, uh, the Deputy Chief Constable has already outlined, there is no policy of backfilling um, of uh, civilian uh, staff uh, posts with uh, police officers. But what I'm more than happy to do is to give the member a breakdown of the percentage of police officers that cover a particular areas. So, for example, 75% uh, of all Police Scotland's officers are responsible are operating within local policing matters, and it breaks down into other specialist fields for regional units and also for national units as well. But if it helped the member uh, in understanding how Police Scotland break down their staff grouping within uh, police officers, I'd be more than happy to write to the member with those details. Thank you very much. Dr Lane Murray, supplementary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, DCT Richardson and uh, Sir Stephen House before him have reiterated that there is no policy on backfilling, but both Unison and the SPF have advised that it's, ha it's happening regularly, and we've now had reports of significant numbers, media reports of significant numbers of police officers not being on police duties. Do you not agree that the SPA should be measuring and monitoring regularly the, the situation as to whether or not police officers are fulfilling police officer functions? Um, sorry, briefly, if you can, please. Well, what I do recognise is I think it is a, an operational matter for uh, the Chief Constable to determine how he chooses to configure his staff uh, and how he wishes to use both his uh, staff and uh, police officers for fulfilling the responsibilities of Police Scotland. The member will also be aware that uh, the, the SP are presently undertaking a piece of work which is looking at potential future demand uh, on policing from cybercrime, <laughs> ageing population, all of these types of issues and what pressures that will then place on policing going into the future. And I have no, no doubt, once they have completed that piece of work, as I mentioned to the committee uh, 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 just yesterday, is it will then be looking at how they configure uh, policing in the future in order to make sure that it is able to meet the demands that are being placed upon it. Thanks so much. Question three, Adam Ingram. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many projects have been funded by the Cash Back for Communities programme in Carrick, Cumnock and Doon Valley? 
Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we are rightly proud of our unique cash back for communities programme and have published information by local authority area on the cash back website. This demonstrates that up to the end of March 2015, young people from both South and East Ayrshire, which span the members' constituency, have directly benefited from over £1.95 million of cash back investment. All cash back projects are required under the terms of their grants to focus activity in deprived areas and at disadvantaged young people. And funding for phase three of cash back is committed through to the end of March 2017. Phase four will commence in April 2017 and the Cabinet Secretary for Justice has yet to make decisions on the next tranche of funding, but I can assure the member that it will build on the su success of the cash back programme, targeting more deprived areas, reducing inequalities and obtaining maximum benefit for communities. Many thanks. Adam Ingram. Okay, the Minister has anticipated uh, a little my uh, follow-up question, but could I ask him uh, to give more detail on, on the plans the Scottish Government have to further develop the fund and also to implement the recommendations of the evaluation report that was published in 2014. I am particularly concerned that any funding available is distributed in a fair and proportionate manner across the country, and I have concerns that my own constituency is perhaps getting less than it should from cash back from communities. Minister? Well, I, I certainly note the, the member's pitch for more funding for for East Ayrshire and South Ayrshire. Um, the recommendations in the evaluation report are being implemented and primarily deal with the process. And uh, as I stated in my initial response, with apologies to the member, I can reassure the member that we will build on the success of the cash back programme and we will uh, target more deprived areas, reducing inequalities and obtaining maximum benefit. Um, Phase three, as I, said, as I outlined in my initial answer, will pick up, uh, we have to pick up additional uh, discussions with some key partners such as YouthLink, Youth Scotland, Princess Trust and Creative Scotland to finalise details. But all cashback partners are required to reassure the member under the terms of their grant to focus activity on areas of deprivation and disadvantage young people. Uh, cashback funding is rightly focused in communities hit by crime and antisocial behaviour. Uh, but we've also taken the view that it's also right that all 32 local authorities in Scotland benefit from those activities and Facilities. But to reassure the member that there are, uh, are a number of key projects he, he may be aware of that, that are funded through uh, partners such as the SFA, where almost half a million pounds has been invested in those two local authorities, YouthLink, where almost again uh, £460,000 has been invested, uh, the Scottish Rugby Union, uh, £291,000, and LinkUp, £211,000. Uh, so there are significant uh, areas of activity. We are working with local partners, national partners, to deliver in both East Ayrshire and South Ayrshire, <coughs> and I hope that benefits young people in Mr Ingram's constituency. Many thanks. Uh, question four in the name of Graham Pearson has been withdrawn for entirely understandable reasons. Question five, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with Police Scotland regarding how it deals with incidents involving people with mental health issues. Secretary Mark Matheson. Over the last three years, the Scottish Government has engaged with a range of partner organisations, including Police Scotland, the NHS, social services and the third sector to consider ways of improving how services respond to people who may have mental health problems and to people who present in distress. Uh, this has included uh, several stakeholder engagement events, two of which were hosted by Police Scotland. A mental health community triage uh, pilot uh, with local policing and Greater Glasgow uh, and Clyde Health Board uh, was approved and implemented in January 2015. This new approach provides officers with direct access to mental health professionals who help support decision-making to improve services to vulnerable members of our community. In August last year, a similar pilot was launched in Edinburgh City in conjunction with Lothian Health Board. Yep, Jim Hume. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for his answer, but the Cabinet Secretary did not uh, provide information on the number of incidences that Police Scotland respond to in relation to potential mental health problems. Uh, so, has there any assessment been carried out of what proportion of incidents the police attend involve a person with, uh, that involve a person with a potential mental health issue? And does he agree with me that there is a greater scope for health professionals to be more involved in such Police Scotland responses? Uh, sign off, sir. I will uh, check to see whether there is um, uh, central information uh, on the very specific point which a member made reference to. But what I can do is give them some information in relation to uh, the project which we have been running in Glasgow in terms of its uh, particular impact. Uh, over the course of a year, uh, there were uh, 234 incidents which were attended to. 
225, uh, which is 96 per cent, were found where the in individual uh, appeared to have <laughs> mental health issues, were found to be fit and well by a CPN, and there was no need for further intervention. And of those, some um, 86 per cent of incidents were resolved by telephone consultation between a CPN and individual concerned. What the evidence does show us, the very significant impact that can actually have on police time and also on individual affected who may have mental health issues or been presenting in distress to make sure they get the right assistance and support as and when uh, required. And I know from uh, time that I've spent with British Transport Police officers, they find that also invaluable because of the assistance it gives them, uh, uh, given it very often uh, there can be issues around uh, train stations and railway lines uh, where individuals are uh, vulnerable. And what we want to do is build on that. That's why that project is now rolled out into Edinburgh. And we're also working with Police Scotland and other health boards to look at how we can then roll that out into other divisions mm. within Scotland in order to make sure that when an individual has a mental health issue, which is a primary issue, that they get the effective support and assistance which is required in order to make sure they get the assistance that they need at that particular point. Many thanks. Question six, Stuart Maxwell. Uh, to, ask the, <coughs> excuse me, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to tackle knife crime in the West Scotland region. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, we are working with various partners to tackle knife crime, including Youth Link Scotland, who support local authorities to deliver the No Knives Better Lies programme. This programme encourages young people away from carrying a knife, building their capacity and potential to make positive life choices for themselves and their families. Violent crime is at its lowest level for 41 years, and since 2006-07, crimes for handling an offensive weapon, including knives, has fallen by 67% nationally. The number of crimes of handling offensive weapons, which include knife crime, recorded in those seven local authorities, which are either wholly or partially within the west of Scotland region, have decreased by 73% since 2006-07. Many thanks. Stuart Maxwell. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that answer and welcome the progress that has been made so far across West Scotland. East Renfrewshire, for example, Minister, now has one of the lowest rates of recorded knife crime across Scotland, with an 82 per cent fall in recorded crimes of handling an offensive weapon since 2006 7 Does the Minister therefore agree with me about the importance of educating young people through the initiatives that he mentioned, such as No Lives, Better Lives, uh, no Nice Better Lives, to ensure that this welcome reduction in, in crime continues? And can he reassure me that there will be no let-up in tackling the scourge of knife crime? Minister. Absolutely. Uh, on the latter point, I can certainly reassure the member that we will not let up our, our efforts to tackle knife crime. We have consistently said the best way to tackle violence is through education and prevention, and our £2.9 million uh, No Knives, Better Lies campaign has been a great success. The member referred to East Renfrewshire with an 82 per cent fall. In North Ayrshire, the decrease has been even bigger at 85 per cent. And um, th this is a, an opt-in national model of delivery flexible to suit local needs. And to date, 11 new local authorities have expressed an interest. Six of these are now actively involved in delivering the programme. And through No Lies, Better Lies, we are uh, reaching out to parents, practitioners, as well as to young people themselves to highlight the, the fact that carrying an offensive weapon is completely unacceptable, can have devastating personal consequences, and there is never an excuse for carrying a knife. And we will continue to work tirelessly with all our partners to get that message across. Annabelle Goldie. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, given the Scottish Government's own data confirms a continuing reliance by judges on short and medium term sentences for persons convicted of carrying an offensive weapon, and that clearly is a deterrent effect, will the Minister confirm that such sentences for such crimes will continue to be available to judges? Uh, clearly, Minister. of course, these sentences will still be available. I uh, am happy to confirm that to, to Ms Goldie. Uh, clearly, what we are looking at in terms of the uh, measures on presumption against short sentences is looking where it is appropriate to, to use an alternative to a, a short sentence, a more effective outcome in terms of reducing reoffending. But clearly, matters of violence and, and where a serious risk is posed to the public, these are matters that would clearly be taken into consideration. Thanks. Question seven, Annabel Goldie. Um, <coughs> Sorry, Presiding Officer, I've mislaid my piece of paper. I do apologise. To ask the Scottish Government when it will publish its response to the consultation and the presumption against short term sentences. Cabinet Secretary Michael Maths. Uh, the consulta consultation on the proposal to strengthen the presumption against short sentences closed on the 16th of December. Uh, we received 63 responses in total, and I would like to record my thanks to everyone who took the time to submit their views on this important issue. We are carefully considering these responses and a formal analysis will be published in the coming weeks. This analysis will, be informed, will inform our approach to strengthening the current presumption against short senses and I intend to set out our plans in due course. 
This consultation forms part of our wider commitment to shifting the emphasis of penal policy from ineffective short sentence, sentences to greater use of robust community sentences. This commitment is backed by an additional £4 million for community justice services in the 2016-17 draft Scottish Budget. Honourable Goldie. <coughs> Officer, the nub of this issue is that governments must neither obstruct nor compromise the freedom of judges to impose a custodial sentence of any length uh, where the judge considers that as how best to serve the interests of justice and the victim. Will the Cabinet Secretary guarantee with the same welcome clarity as his colleague Mr Wheelhouse the continuing protection of that freedom? Cabinet Secretary. Well, a, a presumption is exactly that. It's a presumption. It will be open to sheriffs to determine these matters when the, ma the issue is laid before uh, the court. And that is the case with the presumption against short sentences of three months. If a, a sheriff at a particular point believes that a custodial sentence is the most appropriate uh, action that should be taken, that entirely remains open to them. Any extension of that presumption would mean that they would continue to have the powers to choose to do so. So I can reassure the member of is that a presumption is exactly, exactly that, nothing more than a presumption, and sheriffs will still continue to have the powers to determine where they send someone on a custodial sentence should they see fit to do so. Many thanks, and that concludes that portfolio. We'll now move to portfolio questions on rural affairs, food and the environment. My apologies to those members I haven't been able to call. Question one, Margaret Mitchell. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of the NFU in Scotland. <coughs> Secretary Richard Lockhead. Representatives of the Scottish Government meet with NFU Scotland regularly to discuss a wide variety of topics. The most recent meeting took place on Monday, the 21st of December. Proof of that answer. Is he aware that dog fouling in agricultural land, which affects the quality of crops and the health of animals, is a major issue for farmers, and that the NFU Scotland's pilot poster campaign in Dumbarton, Pentlands and Motherwell, which illustrated by the use of fluorescent light the extent of dog dirt on agricultural land, has half the incidence of dog fouling where the posters were displayed. However, does he agree that ultimately legislation, le legislative change is required in the form of removing section 2.2 of the Dog Fouling Scotland Act, which exempts agricultural land from the provisions of the Act. Uh, can I just say to Margaret Mitchell, I do appreciate this is a very serious issue for Scotland's agricultural sector, and I know the NFU and others issue regular uh, warnings to dog owners to behave responsibly uh, throughout the year. I am not familiar with the initiative that Margaret Mitchell mentioned. I'd be interested to hear more about it. And in terms of the law, I'd be happy to look into the issue she raises and get back to in writing, uh, as I'd be interested to learn more about the potential options to address this issue. Hey, thanks, Sarah Byatt. Much presiding officer, can I ask a different um, supplementary um, in relation to when the Cabinet Secretary last met the NFUS Scotland? Um, has he met them to talk about the impact of flooding? I'm very conscious that um, many farms have lost topsoil. It's been a huge impact as we move into 2016. Um, are there special measures that the Cabinet Secretary will be able to put in place to ensure that our farmers are able to get off to a decent start in 2016? Uh, well, I thank Sarah Boyack for raising this issue in the Chamber as well. I am sure, like other members uh, are, I was totally uh, staggered and amazed by some of the sights I have seen in Scotland's farmland. Uh, yesterday I drove from home in Elgin uh, to Parliament via visits to Inverurie, Brechin uh, and Perth, <coughs> and watching the farmland on the way was uh, an eye-opener as to the level of devastation across the country, but also including uh, farmland. I also used the opportunity to visit a farm just outside Brechin, where I met the Sims uh, at the Kincraig farm and vi viewed their own fields and their arable field where spring barley will be sown. Uh, hopefully in a few months' time, uh, it looked like a part of the river. Uh, and again, it was uh, jaw-dropping to see that. So I am in discussion with the NFU uh, and I will initiate further discussions with the wider sector uh, this week to understand both the scale of the impact on farmland in Scotland and what measures we could take, if any, to help uh, mitigate the impact and work with the farmers moving forward, and I have given a commitment to have those discussions. Thank you. Murdo Fraser, briefly, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. On the same issue of flooding, I wonder if the Scottish Government are able to look at the question of prioritising delayed CAP payments to those farmers most badly affected. In terms of the CAP payments uh, and 
perhaps expediting applications from farmers most affected by flooding. I have said previously, following the recent spate of flooding, forgive the pun, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, that any farmers with specific issues because of flooding should contact their local offices and notify us of their predicaments, uh, and we will see what we can do. I can't make any guarantees because every case will be different across the country, but I am conscious that that may be one option, and I would ask farmers to contact their local offices. Thanks. Question two, Roger Campbell. To ask the Scottish Government what its current position is on a review of the Protection of Wild Mammals Scotland Act 2002. Minister Eileen MacLeod. I announced on the 26th of December that the review of the Act will be led by Lord Bonamy and it will begin taking evidence at the beginning of February. Now, the review will investigate the operation of the Act to ascertain whether it is providing a sufficient level of protection for wild mammals while at the same time allowing effective and humane control of mammals such as foxes where necessary. Lord Campbell. Um, I thank the Minister for that answer. I obviously welcome the Scottish Government's review of the current law. I hope this review will take evidence from Police Scotland on the difficulties of enforcing current legislation, in particular considering the role of hunt monitors and practices such as cubbing. I don't know if the Minister can give us any further reassurance on some of these points. Minister. Well, Lord Bonamy, Lord Bonamy uh, Planning Officer, uh, will decide how to carry out his review, but I am sure that evidence from Police Scotland will be uh, an important part <coughs> of the process. You know, legislation must be enforceable <coughs> to be effective, and it will be for uh, Lord Bonamy himself to take a view on whether the activities of hunt monitors are a factor uh, in the enforceability of the legislation. I understand uh, that cubbing involves uh, the hunting of fox cubs and is therefore squarely uh, within the scope of the review. And I'm sure that everyone that has an interest in the protection of wild mammals will want to engage uh, with Lord Bonamy and I would encourage them to do so. Thanks. Cara Hilton. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, is the Minister concerned at the evidence presented by the League Against Cruel Sports suggesting that fox hunting is still going on in Scotland and what extra support, uh, resources will the Scottish Government commit to ensure that the both current and future legislation in this area is effective and that we genuinely see an end to this cruel and outdated practice? Right. Um, Minister. Well, as I said in my uh, answer to uh, Rod Campbell, this review will look at whether uh, the current legislation is proving the necessary a level of protection for foxes and other wild mammals while allowing for the effective and humane control of those animals where uh, required. Now, that review will obviously will begin uh, this month. Written evidence will be accepted from the 1st of February until uh, the end of March. In Scotland, you know, we led the way in addressing animal welfare concerns with legislation in 2002, and we remain absolutely committed to ensuring the highest level of welfare for our wild mammals. Alex Ferguson. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We did indeed lead the way through that legislation, as the Minister rightly says. But given the minute number of investigations into breaches of the 2002 Act that have actually resulted in a successful prosecution, what justification does the Minister have for initiating this review in the first place? Minister. Well, as I said before, you know, the very fact that we have led the way in addressing the animal welfare, but we have to make sure that the current legislation is actually providing like the necessary level of protection for foxes. And we have had numerous concerns that have been raised with us, but we have to make sure that what we are doing is making sure that the current legislation from the 2002 Act is actually delivering the necessary level of protection that we so want to see in terms of our protection for foxes and our other wild animals. So much. Question three, Gil Patterson. Uh, thanks very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will next meet the Agriculture and Rural Development Department of the European Commission. Secretary. Scottish Government is in regular contact with the European Commission's Directorate General for Agriculture and Rural Development on a wide range of issues, and indeed I met with them personally last month to discuss the impact of the Commission's greening measures on Scottish agriculture. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? I understand that the Cabinet Secretary uh, met with, uh, with counterparts ahead of the discard ban a ban which prevents dead fish from being thrown back into the sea. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on any discussions he has had with the Agriculture and Rural Development Department of the European Commission in respect to the discard ban and possibly delivery of increased fishing quotas? Well, Gil Patterson highlights that 2016 sees new discard bans in Scotland's waters coming into place in relation to 
the discarding of good quality fish dead overboard, which is a, a complete waste. Uh, and for the first year, this will affect the demersal sector, the white fish sector uh, and shellfish sector in Scotland. Uh, clearly, that did feature as part of the negotiations, the annual fisheries negotiations uh, a few weeks ago to look at 2016 fishing opportunities. And I recall a few years ago saying to the European Commission that for the discard bans to work, there had to be a reward for the fishermen to make it practically possible to go to fish and fish all their quotas to have an increase in their quotas that reflected the fact that there were no discard bans in place. So I am pleased that was part of the outcome of last month's negotiations. If you look at North Sea Haddock, for instance, uh, I remember that we had a 30 per cent increase in that stock proposed, uh, which we managed to secure, but that was topped up by a further 17 per cent uh, in quota to account for the discard bans. So it is good that we are seeing a rise in fish quotas to take account of the fact that we now have discard bans in place in Scottish waters. Thank you very much. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he's able to give us uh, a brief update of what the greening um, discussions involved and whether there were any positive outcomes for us here in Scotland in Europe? <coughs> well, I regret in terms of my conversations with the European Commission over greening measures uh, that we made little uh, headway uh, in relation to trying to persuade the European Commission to accept our equivalent schemes to escape the straitjacket of the three crop rule, which is affecting Scotland's arable sector, which is inappropriate for, for Scotland, uh, and the equivalence measures we've been uh, proposing to the European Commission, uh, they attach conditions to those that would have made them unattractive to Scottish farmers. Therefore, we have no option but to try and seek further changes uh, later this year. And we do welcome the fact that at least the European Commission have agreed to review the greening measures within the common agricultural policy, and we'll take full advantage of that opportunity to get them changed in Scotland's favour. Thanks. Question for Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how many eligible crofters and farmers have not received any common agricultural policy basic payment by 6 January 2016. The Cabinet uh, Last week I confirmed that the Scottish Government had issued basic payment and greening payments to around 3,500 farmers and crofters, totalling around £33 million of direct support. This first instalment equated to 75 per cent of farmers and crofters' basic payment value and 90 per cent of their greening values. Uh, it remains our intention to pay the first instalment to the majority of farmers and crofters this month, with the final balance being paid in April, and of course the rest of the first payments being paid in February and March. Davis Scott. I'm, I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Does that not mean that 80 per cent of Scotland's farmers and crofters have yet to receive any cap payment promised by the Government before Christmas, uh, despite indeed spending £178 million on a new computer system? Uh, how many payment region reviews are still outstanding for Shetland alone? What are the implications for LFAS and the U and Beef scheme payments? Will they be late too? And does the Cabinet Secretary understand that farmers and crofters from Shetland to Stranraer are fed up, annoyed and worried about about their cash flow to pay feed bills in this flood-ridden winter Scotland is now enduring. Government Secretary. Uh, whilst I very much appreciate the challenges facing crofters in, in Scotland, indeed uh, the rest of the agricultural sector at the moment, uh, I know the Chamber is familiar with the complexity of the new common agricultural policy and how we've chosen also to implement it in Scotland for very good reasons. I said we begin to make payments to crofters and farmers in Scotland before the end of last year. Uh, we fulfilled that commitment. And yes, of course, there are a fair number of farmers and crofters still to receive their payments. The £178 million business case quoted by Tavish Scott, of course, relates to the whole of the Futures programme, most of which, of course, is the IT system, which is to serve the common agricultural policy that will deliver uh, <coughs> a huge amount of investment to the sector in the coming years and equates actually to 4% of the payments that will go out the door to Scotland's agricultural and rural sectors. So that is necessary investment to get these payments out the door. In terms of the impact on other payments, uh, clearly I'm paying close attention to that. We have said all along there may well be an impact on the timetable for other payments and delay them perhaps for a few weeks. We'll minimise that as much as possible. Uh, in terms of voluntary coupled support payments to beef farmers and uh, sheep farmers, uh, we are aiming for roughly the same time scale as last year as well. Thank you very much. Margaret McDougall. Thank you. Farmers are suffering from adverse weather conditions and their crop yields will be affected. In your answer to earlier questions, you said you would see what you could do. Could you expand on what these options are and will it include accelerating cap payments? 
Cabinet Sec. In terms of the impact of flooding in agriculture, clearly the first thing we have to do is understand the scale of the impact of the atrocious conditions of the last few weeks on Scottish farmland and the consequences of that, and that's what we're doing just now and we'll do in the next few days. I have, however, said to uh, those farmers I've met and will be saying to the official organisations in the next few days that there are issues, for instance, over how to repair the flood damage, some of the regulation around that. There are perhaps some issues that need to be looked at to help it make it easier for the farmers to deal with the, the aftermath of, of flooding, and that will also involve, of course, discussions with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. So until we've had those discussions, it's difficult to say what options are available, but I have given a pledge we will have those discussions to help. Thanks very much. Question five, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in the Common Agricultural Policy Convergence Uplift negotiations with the UK Government. <clears throat> Despite only qualifying for the Convergence Uplift due to Scotland's low payment rate, the UK Government refused to pass on the full allocation to Scotland in what, of course, was a bitter blow to our farmers and crofters. The then Secretary of State did, however, promise to review the UK's allocation of CAP funding in 2016. It is now 2016, and as such, I have today written to the current Secretary of State, urging her to set out the timetable for the review as a matter of the utmost urgency, and I am seeking an early discussion on its terms. Mr. Stevenson. Uh, I very much welcome the news that the Cabinet Secretary is seeking to hold the UK Government to account for its previous promises. Uh, has the Scottish Government made an estimate of the financial loss to the Scottish economy from the loss of these funds, which only came to the UK because of Scotland, and, if possible, uh, any multiplier effects that these funds would have had on our economy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, it uh, was complete larceny, the fact that money that was sent to the UK Government because of Scotland's low payment rates, which allowed the UK Government to qualify for the uplift from the European Commission's Common Agricultural Funding, uh, and of course that money has been denied to Scotland's farmers and crofters and rural communities, at the time was worth £190 million over the course of the current cap. That is a substantial amount of resource, given the number of questions I have just received from members arguing for more investment in the agricultural sector in Scotland. That is Scotland's money. It belongs to Scotland. We only got a small percentage of it, whereas the whole of the £190 million should have come to Scotland. And as Stuart Stevenson quite rightly says, that would have indeed had a multiplier effect across a rural economy and food economies at the same time. So it's essential the UK Government live up to their words and undertake this review immediately with a very short time scale with a view of delivering Scotland's money to Scotland's farmers and crofters and rural communities. Thanks so much. Question six, James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to ensure that its obligations under the Climate Change Scotland Act 2009 are being met. Minister Aileen McLeod. Uh, President Officer, we are ensuring that our obligations under the Climate Change Scotland 2009 Act are met through a range of actions. We have put in place a comprehensive package of measures to meet our world-leading emission reduction targets. And Scotland is now more than three-quarters of the way towards achieving our 42 per cent emissions reduction target in 2020. Our Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change underpins our commitment and through our Rural Affairs, Food and the Environment Delivery Board, we are leading and coordinating action on climate change by our public sector partners, including on peatland restoration and forestry to protect and conserve the environment. Yep, James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. The Minister will understand that improving energy efficiency in homes is vital uh, in order to tackle climate change and reduce fuel poverty. It's therefore somewhat bewildering uh, in the light of the Paris Climate Change Summit that the Government is proposing to cut fuel poverty and energy efficiency budgets by 13 per cent. Can the Minister state uh, what impact assessment was taken in relation to this budget proposal and also what uh, effect that would have on climate change targets and tackling fuel poverty? Minister. I um, can say to the, uh, the member that obviously energy efficiency is a priority for the Scottish Government. It has been designated a national infrastructure priority in recognition 
of its importance. As we've already set out before, that the cornerstone of that will be uh, Scotland's Energy Efficiency Programme, which will provide an offer of support to all buildings in Scotland, domestic and non-domestic, to improve their energy efficiency uh, ratings over a 15 to 20 year uh, period. Now, obviously, that energy efficiency programme will provide that offer of support and improving the energy efficiency of our buildings is key to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, tackling our fuel poverty, improving our energy security and making our economy more competitive. Now, in terms of the energy efficiency programme itself, the detail of that programme still needs to be developed. We will be working with stakeholders over the next couple of years because we need to undertake further modelling and analysis to understand uh, what is possible before launching the new programme in 2017-18, once the powers have been recommended by the Smith Commission are in place. Thank you. Question 7, Mark Griffin. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it encourages the development of new allotment sites. Minister Aileen MacLeod. Uh, the Scottish Government strongly supports the development of allotments for food growing, recognising the range of benefits that they bring to both individuals and communities. Now, we introduced uh, last year, Presiding Officer, the Community Empowerment Act, which places new duties on local authorities in respect of allotments, including a requirement to take steps to limit uh, waiting lists and waiting times for those on such lists. Now, we believe these provisions will strongly encourage the development of new allotment sites and thereby increase uh, access to allotments for people throughout Scotland. Thank you. Mark Griffin. I thank, that, thank the Minister for that answer. I have been approached by constituents in Cumbernauld who have said that demand for allotment sites is far outstripping supply and funding was to be made available to local authorities for their new responsibilities under the Community Empowerment Act that the Minister has just mentioned for developing allotment sites. Can the Minister say how much money the Government has made available to local authorities to increase the number of allotments in the central Scotland region? Minister. Well, can I thank the, uh, the member for his uh, question and I appreciate the sentiments behind that question. But I am very happy for the member if he wants to uh, write to me uh, in terms of being able to get some more further information and detail around that. I would be very happy uh, to take that on board. Many thanks. Um, and my apologies to those members who have been unable to call, but we are happy.